So good evening and, and uh, welcome to all. Um, I should uh, begin just by mentioning, as I always do, uh, please, if you don't wish to be recorded, um, do switch off your cameras or mics. Otherwise, please feel free to uh, participate in the measure that is right and, and, and adequate uh, to your uh, liking. Uh, also, I should apologize that there was a bit of a uh, an issue with the, there was a change in time all along the west coast of North America. And so we are starting um, one hour uh, later, uh, as it uh, may seem. We haven't changed our time uh, this side of the pond, but there has been a change uh, uh, over there. So my sincere apologies, we should have checked that. Um, and uh, the proceedings tonight uh, are going to be very simple. We have uh, Vivian Lovell, who shall be talking about the art of urban memory. Um, and uh, of course, the session will be uh, uh, chaired uh, by Eric Parry. Um, Vivian will then do um, uh, uh, her presentation, uh, which should be about 40 minutes, maybe. Let's see. Um, uh, and this will be followed by questions. Now, uh, of course, everybody's invited to to participate within the measure of time available. But um, uh, Nick Temple may perhaps wish to start if it helps. Uh, and, and Dagmar perhaps uh, just to uh, um, put us in, in a sort of pole position there before Eric opens it to the floor. And that is all from me. Uh, I think Matthew may have a few notices from uh, London Met. Uh, Matthew, if you wish. Uh, hi, thank you, uh, Jose. And from the perspective of London Metropolitan, welcome everyone uh, and uh, welcoming also some new um, visitors from from our, from our side of things uh, this evening. I believe Pierre Davoine is here tonight, for example. Um, just to say that this is the fifth event in the series. We're really happy with the way it's going in this collaboration with Eric Parry Architects, um, and we're hoping to um, extend into other things in due course. Um, just uh, looking ahead, the next event in this series is on Tuesday, the 27th of April, when Patrick Lynch will be the sixth uh, speaker in the series. Um, that's all from me, uh, and I'll hand back to Eric to start the session. Thanks very much, Matthew, and I, I just wanted to uh, create a really warm welcome for Vivian, um, who, with whom uh, I've shared a conversation for, I think, more than 20 years, um, and uh, her own work goes far, far beyond that in terms of uh, the roots of the conversation that she's going to share with us tonight. Um, it's just an incredibly important uh, part of the uh, urban world, particularly, and I'm very, very keen uh, on the way in which uh, visual arts can take the narrative of architecture further than architects can themselves. We need to understand that uh, visual artists are, are real specialists, wonderful uh, creative uh, conversation with them over material, shape, form, um, in, in many ways. And that is additive. It's not understood enough, I believe, in the in the discourse of architecture and, and the public realm. This is a complementary world and not one that uh, architects particularly, uh, or, or landscape architects for that matter, you know, are, are um, expert in generally so it is collaborative uh, and at its best is 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 fantastically important so uh, without further ado I, i'm really looking forward to listening to vivian who is a a massively successful curator of public art and uh, it, that goes without uh, without saying so vivian it's fantastic to have you and we really look forward to to hearing from you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric, and thank you, London Met, for inviting me to give this presentation. May we have the first slide, please? Is it sharing? <laughs> it's 
So the subject I'm going to talk about, the art of urban memory, focuses <clears throat> on the ways in which artists particularly have contributed to the redefinition of monuments and memorials today. Next image, please. First definitions, monuments, which is rooted in the Latin monere to remind, advise, warn and teach. A memorial is a statue or structure established to remind people of a particular event or person. There's a wonderful quotation by the novelist Robert Musil, Austrian, who was writing almost 100 years ago. And he held that monuments may begin and end in tumult, but in between they become inert. And that there is really nothing in the world as invisible as monuments. But in fact, today, monuments and memorials, far from being invisible, are coming under greater scrutiny than ever before. And many are indeed ending in two months. These objects that shape our perceptions and memories of cities have come into sharp focus as an art form category today. And they raise questions about who and what we commemorate, who gets to select, who owns and maintains such works. And why is there more commemoration of doers rather than those who have suffered? In recent decades, artists and some architects have explored antitheses of monumentality, such as counter monuments, non monuments and anti monuments. And they have sought to address issues of public space and site specificity, fixity and transience. Today, prominent people and historic events may be commemorated in a variety of different forms, which include temporary installations, light, uh, performance, text, gardens, films, ephemera, um, as well as through sculptures. Negotiating the territory between wise public engagement and personal empathy is a key challenge mm. to artists working in this sphere. And involving the viewer in a time-based experience or through memory of the temporal artwork can be a more powerful tactic than a permanent icon. Beginning then this huge subject with um, the category of counter monuments and memorials, invisibility, the negative space. Next slide, please. And I'm presenting um, my case studies with different categories of approach for ease of presentation. Next slide, please. Starting with the work of the German artist Jochen Gertz. Next image, please. <clears throat> Who's a brilliant exponent of the counter monument and memorial. This one, sorry. Can we go back one? <laughs> Just flicked on too quickly. The Monument Against War and Fascism and For Peace is on the edge of Hamburg. It stood 15 meters high. And what it does is to not try to battle repression by attempting to stand forever. Indeed, it was planned to be lowered every few months, a few meters. And now it has disappeared entirely below ground, although visible from a chamber below ground, during which time the public were invited to inscribe into the lead surface their marks, as it were, against the atrocities carried out in the, the Holocaust. Next. Also by Gertz, the monument against racism in Saarbrücken where invisibility is the key, and indeed the square has been named after the sculpture here, which was carried out by stealth. Um, it was illegal. It wasn't commissioned, but Jochen Gertz worked with local students inscribing the names and locations of um, Jewish cemeteries that had been in existence before the outbreak of the Second World War, but had um, been erased from maps. These were inscribed 
on over 2,000 stones, which are underneath the surface of this powerful piece. Next, please. And continuing to show you Jochen Goetz's approach to this fascinating subject, he presented in Coventry for the Phoenix Initiative, the Future Monument. And of course, monuments are really all about the past, but this was a future monument. And what it did was to call on immigrants communities to name their past enemies as their friends. So to qualify for a plaque, there had to be 40 or so people in a community who could then name, for example, our German friends, our English friends and so forth. And it still stands there today. Next, please. Looking again at the theme of invisibility, the work of Misha Ullmann in Babelplatz, Berlin, commemorated a library that was burned and the book burning that took place on that very spot in Babelplatz in 1933 with the rise of Nazism. And quoted here is from Heinrich Heine, that was but a prelude where they burn books, they will ultimately burn people as well. Next, please. Also in Berlin, the monuments by the duo Elm Green and Dragset, who commemorated the 50,000 odd gay people who were murdered along with Jews and disabled and gypsies in this very mute, stark, concrete memorial um, with just one aperture through which you can see a video of a, a gay couple kissing. It has been vandalised um, fairly recently and restored. Next, please. Rachel Whiteread, um, looking again at the uh, theme of the Holocaust, was commissioned in Vienna with a piece that took five and a half years from inception to unveiling. As much as it is a sculpture, Whiteread's memorial is a closed, windowless, single story building, and the walls are covered from top to bottom in row upon row of books. And it's as though they've been turned to face the wall. And you see the edges of the book covers, the closed pages, made completely of concrete. And there's a pair of doors at one end of the building which is sealed shut. A metaphor for finality, certainly. Next, please. In fact, Rachel Whitetree has excelled at employing the tactic of casting negative spaces into solid form to crystallise meaning. This house, which existed for nearly 11 weeks in situ prior to its destruction, won her the Turner Prize in 1993. It was always planned to be a temporary piece, but in fact, um, such was its success that uh, there was a call for the work to be made permanent. Um, that wasn't ever going to be the case and Tower Hamlets did indeed fulfil their original uh, permission for it only to be a temporary work and it was demolished. But what it was, was really a celebration of under celebrated normality. It's a domestic space. It um, memorialises the everyday to some extent. And so powerful is it, but it remains permanently in the memory. Next, please. And as with Jochen Goetz, we're continuing to look at Rachel Whitreed's work for um, just another, another example of her practice, which was room 101 in the BBC Broadcasting House, renovated by MJP architects and restored and um, added to. John Riddy commemorated Room 101 where Orwell had worked during the Second World War and where he conceived the horrific novel 1984 and of course Room 101 was the 
torture chamber in that novel. And indeed, this was the room when we, when we first found it. It was empty, full of, but only full of vents and pipes. Rachel Whitetrees, who we invited to look at it, decided she wanted the whole thing stripped out and she moved in. And next slide, please. She cast the whole space, leaving the scars in the surface of the sculpture. And we gained permission to show this piece in the Victorian Albert's cast courts for a year and a half before it was, uh, it was finally bought by the Beaubourg in Paris. It was only ever going to be a temporary work, but it again it sort of became a monumental work that in the V&A was surrounded by further monuments and the memorials in the cast court. Next, please. Wars and pandemics have been a category of memorial. And next slide, please. Quite a lot changed in people's attitudes to what war memorials might be with the work of Maya Lin, who won an open competition um, with her proposal for nothing like a cenotaph, as you see in the the background, this immense colonnade in Washington, um, but a, an abstract work that took you right down into the ground and used reflection and naming as its tactic. So this was minimalism and abstraction text and almost implicating the viewer in the work through reflection, literally and metaphorically. Next, please. The centenary of the ending of the First World War in Britain um, was the opportunity to commission a number of artists. And this one was commissioned, which incorporates over almost 900,000 ceramic poppies toured to different locations um, throughout the UK and created really a vast installation that was instantly successful and very very engaging, very popular work and becomes really like a place and differs with each setting in which it is located. <clears throat> Next, please. And around that time, there became the debate, what could a new kind of war memorial be? What should it be? This wonderful quote from Horace, I will raise a monument more lasting than bronze. And this was, in a sense, publicising or prelude to the work of Jeremy Della. Next slide, please. And Jeremy Della works closely with the National Theatre, with its director Rufus Norris, and staged the most extraordinary performance in one day, 1st of July 2016, which is the centenary of the Battle of the Somme. And there were over 1400 volunteers involved in this piece who dressed in First World War British uniform. They were seen throughout the UK in streets and town squares, train stations and shopping centres. In fact, I came across them in the Angel Shopping Centre in Islington, and each participant represented one of the soldiers killed on the first day of the battle. And keeping silent, they handed cards to members of the public with the details of the soldier they represented. Next slide, please. Next, please. <clears throat> and their silence was occasionally broken with the wartime song, We're Here Because We're Here, which lent the whole project its title. Della was already well known for his large scale engagement project, The Battle of Orgreave, which um, restaged the miners' strike of 1984. This took place in 2001 
where he works with volunteers with ex miners and created this restaging of the battle, bringing it back into public focus. Next slide, please. The next subcategory of monuments memorials I wanted to talk about was that of wars and pandemics. And the AIDS memorial quilt springs to mind. It was the inspiration of an artist and his friend in 1987. And it was displayed for the first time in the National Mall in Washington, D.C. And has been staged in different cities throughout the United States. It now resides permanently in San Francisco. Next slide, please. But with other pandemics, the flu epidemic of 1918 to 19, which killed more people than um, by a long way than were killed in the First World War, were uncommemorated in the UK and as elsewhere to my knowledge, except for this one work, which was realised in 2002. And it's in a medical library chapel next to the Royal London in Whitechapel. And it's by the German artist Johannes Schreiter. And what he's done is use abstraction, um, but minimal graphs to indicate the rise in cases. And, a, not, and also the molecular structure of an antiviral agent used to treat that flu. And the colours blue, purple and white symbolise blue, the medical help people were getting, the purple in the middle, the colour of suffering, and the white, that of healing. Next slide, please. But what of a COVID-19 memorial, which has been much talk formally and informally, and a memorial garden has been proposed, um, that was announced by the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. Um, but meanwhile, the public continue to praise the NHS, the unpaid, underpaid NHS, I should say, with these delightful rainbows that have appeared in many, many windows nationally. And indeed, the, the clapping which has taken place over the last year or so. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Four days ago, um, there was a leader in the, the Guardian claiming that the pandemic's impact has not been digested yet. It's too soon to erect memorials, which is making quite a good point, I think. Next. Moving on then to monuments to victims of persecution and terrorism. And although this first example is far from being an urban example, next slide please. It's really in a category of its own. And it's in the far north of Norway, beyond the Arctic Circle. And it's by Louise Bourgeois, the late Louise Bourgeois, great artist, and Peter Zumthor, who were already collaborating on a project for Dear Beacon, um, which didn't finally come off. But when the opportunity came up to commemorate the trial and execution of 91 people who had been um, murdered, accused of witchcraft, um, they seized the opportunity and Zumthor well, in fact, Bourgeois was about 94 at the time that they were commissioned, so she asked Zumthor to go and check out the site for her. And Zumthor said she was to make the art installation and I would make the shell. But in fact, what happened was that Zumthor made this long building with a wooden framework and a sailcloth like walls, and he designed small windows randomly punched on both sides to commemorate those executed. And he uh, designed a separate building for Bourgeoisie's piece, The Damned, The Possessed and The Beloved, it's called. 
which is this, this work you see bottom left, an aluminium chair with gas flames shooting out of the seat. And the burning chair is reflected in seven oval mirrors placed on metal columns in a ring around the fiery seat, like judges, it said, circling the condemned. Next, please. And a recent, again, a recent memorial to those who have been persecuted. In this case, the Peterloo Memorial in Manchester, which was a collaboration between Jeremy Della, um, who chose to work with Caruso Sinjin. And it is like a compass. It's on a landscaped hill with locations looking out to the names of towns and villages carved in stone, uh, along with the names of the, the dead. It killed 18 people from this peaceful protest, lobbying for parliamentary reform. It's been the subject of a recent film by, by Mike Lee. Next, please. And this just shows a contemporaneous um, illustration of the the scale and complexity of that uprising. Next, please. And the next slide is a detail of the, the work, but also an interesting quote from Della, um, who was asked by the council, Manchester City Council, to tell the story and avoid a figurative interpretation. He said, I'm not a figurative artist. And he feels that figurative sculpture can date quite easily. And he said could become quite kitsch, so it's good to avoid that in public sculptures. His opinion, which is an interesting one, obviously he's more into performance and abstraction. Next, please. Looking at ter terrorism, sadly, as the occasion for memorials to be commissioned. The dreadful events of 9-11 um, were eventually commemorated in this Ground Zero project by Michael Arez and landscape architect Peter Walker, which took six years to realise from open competition to completion. And below ground, next slide please, in the Memorial Museum below ground, the artist Spencer Finch, who had witnessed um, the 9-11 event from his studio in Brooklyn, was commissioned for his idea to make almost 3,000 handmade paintings. These are little watercolours um, sealed on the wall, slightly different colours of blue, one square for every person killed in the September 11th attacks, the colour of the skies, the artist remembered it on that morning when he saw this all happen from his studio. Next, please. In Britain, um, just four years after 9-11, there was the 7th of July terrorist attacks on the tube and on buses and an open competition was held, organised by DCMS, um, with a, a million pound, including that budget, seems to be the amount they normally throw at a disaster monument. Um, it was won by Carmody Groek with Anthony Gormley, and it creates a place, um, which is important, a place of reflection and pilgrimage. And they worked closely with the members of the bereaved families on the whole work. The steli, these abstract forms, each bear the date and place of one of the 57 deaths, um, but the names are recorded on a separate plaque, which you see bottom right. Next, please. And I must say, the whole subject of memorials is very dear to British hearts particularly, I think. Um, further work was commissioned, a memorial to British victims of terrorism overseas. And Alison Wilding won this with the designer, Adam Kershaw. 
again, creating place and inscribed with the wording, this memorial is for everyone who has been affected by terrorism overseas. Next, please. Commemorating the individual, um, and obviously this has been approached in different ways through figuration, through text, through metaphorical forms. Uh, but it's very interesting. The whole debate is extremely current about who, does, who decides who is commemorated and why. Next, please. And starting with a couple of benchmark commissions, um, which I'm rather fond of, I have to say. The GF Watts uh, initiative, he was an artist working in the 19th century, early 20th century. And it was his idea to create a memorial to those lost, those who lost their lives through acts of heroic self-sacrifice. Uh, this is located in Postman's Park in the city. It was in, unveiled in 1900 with only four plaques and um, the last plaques were added in the 1930s. Next, please. Where we see some more examples of very, very moving and very simply um, put in in language that's very accessible, but very, very poignant. Next, please. And as far as I'm concerned, a benchmark in figurative sculpture, um, which is problematic today in so far as it's not widely taught well. Um, but the work of Charles Sergeant Jagger really stands out for me. This is the Paddington World War I memorial, which is at once deeply personal. It's very humane. It's very specific in its details of dress. Um, and yet it's generalized in the sense that it is and every man, it's um, a young soldier who could be somebody's brother or son or cousin. Next, please. <clears throat> and we cut to Parliament Square here with the work of Gillian Waring and her statue of Millicent Fawcett, the suffragist, and who was commissioned, the whole sculpture was commissioned after a successful campaign. It's first ever monument for a woman created by a woman to be cited in Parliament Square. And alongside Fawcett, you just see at the top of the plinth the names of um, and photograph, photographic images of 59 men and women who campaigned for um, along with her. <clears throat> it's interesting that it was modelled using the latest 3D scanning system based on original photographs. Um, it comes across as being, to my mind, extremely traditional. And um, I'm not sure it has enormous presence. Perhaps it's too specific in some ways, but one can argue about that. Next, please. and cut to Maggie Hamlin's memorial to Mary Wollstonecraft, the writer, feminist pioneer and philosopher. And it is sited in Newington Green, um, North Islington. And to me, is it's not only been highly controversial, but it um, is the wrong scale and its setting. I think it misses the opportunity to commemorate somebody of Wollstonecraft's standing. Um, I don't think it's a fitting memorial. It's a, a mini sculpture on top of a, an amorphous mass. Next, please. Going back to Parliament Square, um, to Churchill, and this was commissioned in 73. Um, uh, it's by Ivor Roberts Jones. It's a, a very accomplished sculpture, a huge edifice, obviously, um, but inevitably sets itself up as, as a target. Parliament Square, of course, is a great rallying point for demonstrations. Next, please. 
<clears throat> just three examples of the way it's, it's been attacked over the years, over the last 20 odd years. Next, please. Alternative approaches by artists to marking Churchill's work include song by Paul de Monchot, very accomplished sculptor who was commissioned following the BBC Great Britain's programme. And he created something that was a, a metaphor for Churchill's speeches and the way in which, next slide please, the way in which he typed out um, his speeches um, with these sort of cadences and he called them psalm style. So you'll see the indentation, um, which his voice would rise and fall, very famous voice that um, of course was broadcast from BBC Broadcasting House throughout the Second World War. Um, Paul de Monchot's song, which was cited tem temporarily in Westminster Hall and is now in the collection of uh, Cambridge College. Next, please. Jen Jenny Holzer, a um, well-known American artist, also put forward a proposal for Churchill's commemoration. This was under the BBC Broadcasting House Public Art Programme, um, extracting from his speeches that were indeed broadcast from that building. And this, in fact, coincided with the start of the Iraq war. And it was it was quite chilling to read the words that she had, she had chosen. We await undismayed um, the impending assault and so forth. And this would have scrolled across the surface of Broadcasting House, but um, was not to be. It was finally not commissioned. Next, please. Frank Pick, an example of how text continuing the um, Holzer theme, how an individual can be commemorated through the use of text. In this case, um, his key attributes immortalized in this memorial to the wonderful Frank Pick, who was chief executive of London Transport, of course, and led a brilliant program of architecture and design and he is commemorated at Piccadilly Tube Station um, by the artists Langs and Bell. Next, please. The poet Wilfred Owen is the cause, the subject of this elegant and beautiful and modest commission in Shrewsbury Abbey Churchyard by Paul de Marcia again. It's entitled Symmetry, and it uses metaphor, material, form, and text co-aligned. The starting point was the Wilfred Owen Society wanting uh, to commemorate the poetry, not the man. So it certainly didn't want a figurative piece. The winning entry by Paul de Monchou took Strange Meeting, that powerful poem as the starting point, which alludes to the long, dark, granite tunnels where Owen meets the ghost of the German soldier he has killed. And there's the line, I am the enemy, you killed my friend, which is inscribed on the sculpture. Next, please. <clears throat> and an ephemeral memorial to an individual, an individual artist in this case, Stephen Cripps, who was a pyrotechnics artist who died in the 80s. And his co-artist, friends and Bina Richard Wilson, chose to commemorate him with ice. <clears throat> Interesting that an artist who worked with fire was commemorated through an ice memorial that melted in 24 hours over a June day. Uh, the ice blocks contained objects which alluded to Stephen Cripps's life. It was a shrine-like as well as ephemeral, because when the ice melted, the objects became the sort of shrine on the, the wooden cladding below. <coughs> Next slide, please. <clears throat> 
talking of shrines, <clears throat> the cult figure of the rock star David Bowie uh, became the site of a temporary shrine when he died in 2016, uh, approximately three years after this mural had been painted by James Cochran in Brixton. And it's a way of in which the public can individually respond by leaving flowers, lit candles, messages, and so forth. Next, please. <clears throat> Details of the same mural. Next, please. And the next category is the intervention by artists or the appropriation <clears throat> of existing monuments. Um, and, and that includes buildings as monuments. Next, please. <clears throat> Major exponents of this particular type of approach are Christo and Jean-Claude. Um, Christo died during the last year, Jean-Claude a few years before. Very famous in their practice is the wrapping of the Reichstag which took um, over 20 years to complete um, of negotiation. All of their wrappings are paid for out of the Christo Foundation, but of course, permissions have to be gained. And this was a struggle spanning the 70s, 80s and 90s. And it remained wrapped for 14 days and really um, marked out a building that had experienced its own continuous changes Built in 1894, it was burned in 1933, almost destroyed in 1945, restored in the 60s, but the Reichstag always remained the symbol of democracy. Next, please. <clears throat> Artists' responses to everyday buildings, structures and memorials allow us to see the, the familiar through really new eyes and in this case, to get up close and personal with a memorial. Uh, the case in point here is the memorial to Queen Victoria in Liverpool uh, by C.J. Allen, 1906. And Tatsunishi um, has made a practice out of uh, allowing one to spend a night with a, a memorial. In this case, you get to sleep with a queen for the night. He creates a scaffolding around the structure and there's a booking system and you can see bottom right slide there's a double bed and a chest of drawers and a comfy chair for you to spend your night alongside Queen Victoria. It's a way of um, domesticating the normally unreachable and the formal. Next please. In Victoria, and oh, sorry, in London, Trafalgar Square has become an epicentre of installations over the last few decades. Christoph Vodichko, in an earlier Art Angel installation, made this piece Projections of Power um, onto Nelson's column. And here the artist is challenging and almost disempowering the column, um, which was, of course, to celebrate the winning of the Battle of Waterloo through projecting a huge nuclear warhead in light throughout its length. Next, please. <clears throat> and this hub of power and formality now hosts the fourth Plinth project, which was started by the Royal Society of Arts in 99, the late 90s, and now is run by the GLA. <clears throat> the plinth had remained empty for various reasons I won't go into now, but the project began with Mark Wallinger's Echo Homo on the eve of the millennium, a very fragile human scale figure standing right on the edge of the plinth. Next. And it continued and there's one about every year or two years. In Kishonibari's work stands out, Ship in a Bottle. And these richly patterned sails, which is of course um, on Nelson's ship Victory, um, they were produced, they 
They were inspired by Indonesian batik and produced by Dutch traders and sold in West Africa, where the artist is from. Next. And a very recent commission, um, my Michael Rakowitz, which is a recreation of one of the stone statues which guarded the gates of the ancient city of Nineveh. Destroyed in 2015 by ISIS, um, along with 7,000 other objects. And it's made out of 10,500 empty Iraqi date syrup cans. So it's recycled as well as being a powerful piece. In the background, you'll see St. Martin, St. Martin's in the fields. And next slide, please. Under its renewal project by Eric Parry Architects, a number of art commissions have been realised and presented here as a way in which new memories of cities are forged and how the familiar, in this case a grade one listed church, um, can almost be represented and re reinterpreted. It's by Cherise Hougiri and Pip Horn. Next, please. The final category I'd like to present to you is Topplings, the politics of disruption. And we're reminded of Robert Museum monuments may begin and end in tumult. Next slide, please. Of course, the huger the monuments, the more it's undermined. And Russia used to have over 7,000 statues of Lenin. And where have they all gone? There's topplings of statues of men who've led oppressive political regimes and the more oppressive, the greater the number of statues, it seems, in Russia, Iraq, Ukraine, Hungary. The list goes on. Next, please. Saddam Hussein was toppled in 2003. Private Eye featured it can't really see the caption it says it's all over bar the looting next please and perhaps budapest has the answer which had a huge number of soviet statues and it now has memento park which includes even um stalin's boots on a plinth bottom left which were all that were left of the statue after it was pulled down Next, please. <clears throat> Juxtaposing these enormous political figures as a question of scale, really. The guerrilla sculptor Kolotko has made this miniature sculpture commemorating the poet and parachutist Hannah Zenez. And in fact, Budapest is planning at the moment an ephemeral memorial dedicated to women who were raped during wartime. Next, please. Everything began to change in the last year in terms of attitudes to monuments and memorials with the killing of George Floyd on the 25th of May last year in Minneapolis. Next, please. And people took to the streets there were demonstrations, murals, tributes, graffiti, much of which involved artists and were artists led in the USA, UK and to some extent worldwide, wherever there were statues erected to those with connections to slavery. Next, please. And the BLM protests that accompanied the pandemic over the summer amplified this ongoing revelation about monuments and memorials, many of which were deeply racist in the first place. In the USA, many statues of Confederates came under attack, um, retain and explain or remove and store or destroy. A case in point being Robert E. Lee, Confederate um, statue of him in Richmond, Virginia, and recently a judge rules in favor of its removal 
as it's a symbol of divisiveness and was initially raised against the background of white supremacy. Next, please. Many seminars and conferences are currently being organized and research projects started, including the Mellon Foundation, um, which is going to allocate $250 million towards this project, as they say, to recalibrate the assumed center of our national narratives to include those who have often been denied historical recognition. And there are projects going on with the Henry Moore Trust in the UK, ETH in Zurich, the Highline and Next City in New York. The list continues. Next, please. And the list of city collections of statues are being audited and analysed statistically and gaps identified. And in Bristol, very soon after the death of Floyd, the statue of Colston was hauled off its plinths. It had already been the subject of a virtual installation by the artist Hugh Locke about 15 years ago on the right. Next, please. So Colston was hauled off his plinths and dumped in the canal by demonstrators, only to be rescued and put into store later. Um, very soon after, next slide please, Mark Quinn, um, a YBA, a young British artist, now not so young, sees the opportunity in, to install his own new sculpture of Jen Reed, a black BLM protester on the empty plinth, but not for long. This provoked a row and a leader in the art newspaper by the artist Tom Price arguing that a white privileged supremacist artist like Mark Quinn should not assume he has the right to seize the plinth for his own sculpture. Next, please. And Mayor Marvin Rees, who happens to be the first black mayor in Europe, speaking at a conference organized by the Highline in New York, said the Colston statue removal was an act of historical poetry but toppling is like a lynching. Social change must follow. Next, please. Further statues in the UK with slavery or racist connections have been toppled and graffitied. And opinions are now polarized. Um, this is one opinion. This is held by the government. Next, please. Artists, for the most part, um, or many artists feel otherwise, that their statues are not necessarily a reflection, true reflection of history. Next, please. And there are bulletins, news bulletins almost daily. There's a new diversity commission being set up by the GLA, which the mayor says is not about removing statues, um, it's aiming to reflect the capital's diverse population. Next, please. This is all brewed up into an amazing um, row, this fury as the government pushes its anti-woke agenda, attempting to overrule museums and heritage bodies advisory roles in assessing the worth of monuments and memorials. And the, the whole arm's length principle is being threatened, say, uh, Chris Smith and Ed Vasey, both lords um, and both former arts ministers. Next, please. And only days ago, um, there was a peaceful vigil in Clapham to reclaim the safety of the streets which was interrupted by very heavy handed police, as we as we all know. And when the march went towards Parliament Square, the police were told to protect Churchill at all costs. And there were chants to counter that, protect women, not statues. Next slide, please. Only two days ago, there was a bill um, which proposed 10 years for defacing a statue. 
while rapists serve only five years. So today, monuments and memorials are under greater scrutiny as a category of public art than ever before. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian. Um, that was extraordinary in its scope and, uh, and depth. So uh, I'd like to open the floor to questions, of course. And um, I think uh, the suggestion was that perhaps uh, Nicholas Temple might begin. Thank you very much, Vivian. It was a really interesting and thought provoking uh, lecture and I think it kind of raises lots of questions about what me the memorial means today, uh, let alone what it meant in the past. I've, I've got a couple of observations, um, just some notes that I've been writing furiously down. There's, there's an interesting question about the way in which so many memorials that have been constructed uh, in the recent past really deal with this notion of void, emptiness, framing of, 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 of space that is that is vacated or, or waiting for something else to replace it. A kind of meditation on, on this notion of almost the permanence of emptiness. Mm. And um, in a way, this, this is a kind of perhaps a testimony to the shift, a radical shift away from figurative representation, which you, you highlighted in the second read, really the second part of your, uh, of your presentation. Um, and the, the kind of reliance, I guess, on both ground and wall as, as sites for inscription and for kind of pondering events of the past in, in, in sometimes very stark ways. And I just interested, I mean, in, in, in one sense, we see how, how one deals with monuments in, the, in, that, in those terms, almost, almost waiting for something to be filled. And, and I guess the other at the other end of the spectrum, where we talk about this issue of temporality and participatory dimensions of, of monumentality of monuments, where the monument is basically an ephemeral construct, or it's a participate and it's an event, it's an action, or things that are there that we carry away, the memory is something that we, it's a moment or, or an experience, um, rather like a performance, mm -hmm. and then it's removed. And then, and then we're left basically with something else. There seems to be two very contrasting spectrums of actually how we deal with monuments today, mm. both equally problematic in, in many different ways. But I'm, I'm interested in your kind of observations about, I guess, about the architectural setting of the monument. Uh, what this tells us about the role of the architect in dealing with the construction of monuments or places for for memory? I think there are various ways in which architects are involved, clearly. One is through collaboration with an artist like the Zumtor and Bourgeois example, um, or indeed the Jeremy Della and Caruso Sinjin Memorial to Peterloo in Manchester. And I think ideally the collaboration should not simply be about who does what and the architect creating the setting for the artist's work. It really should be much more a meeting of minds if it is a collaboration and it should be a shared concept realised through the talents of them both. And you set out uh, very neatly, you've encapsulated all of the categories in your question that I talked about, and I think they're all valid categories. You know, I don't see them as being necessarily problematic. And I think there's a very strong role for the, the ephemeral, the temporal, the performance, which can, of course, be captured in, in video, film, um, but also social media. And very importantly, exists permanently in the memory and works by word of mouth. So it's a 
brief reply to a complex question. So I don't think there's a neat answer to how the architect can be can best be involved. You know, obviously with a an example like St Martin in the Fields, one has a Grade One listed building, and then there's the fantastic renewal project by Eric Parry Architects, which again creates a further layer of setting um, to a work such as the East Window. So that's a sort of multi-layered approach to different creative talents coming together. Hmm. Math, Matthew, uh, let, thank you for that. Let, let's follow with your, your question, please. Uh, sure, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Vivian. Um, I think that there's obviously many, many points to pick up on 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 this, but um, I was thinking about uh, what you said about um, Jeremy Dada's comments uh, with regard to the memorial, um, I think to P Peterloo, um, where he said he wouldn't want to do something figurative because it would be become dated and it may well become kitsch. Um, and I was reminded by um, something that Sandy Wilson actually wrote with regard to uh, um, looking back at history and not applying uh, the appropriate level of responsibility with regard to the claims of history on the future. Uh, and he talked about the problem of uh, forms appropriated incorrectly leading to kitsch, which is a kind of, he argued, was a kind of a separation from the obligation to tradition. Um, but at the same time, I think one of the issues with monuments, especially when we look at this kind of range of monuments that you've been showing us, is the problem of them not being uh, sufficiently legible and not connecting with the people that they may well be wishing to represent. So um, I guess my question, therefore, if we are thinking about monuments, especially in the urban context, having this um, responsibility to the city and to the public as, as markers that in some way should be legible. What about the question of taste? Are some kitsch monuments acceptable? Um, Maggie Hamblings obviously is not to your taste <laughs> and not to mine either, um, but it's figurative and maybe it immediately has that quality of kitsch through a number of uh, problems. Um, I've been working recently with um, one of our members of staff, Bob and Roberta Smith, um, mm -hmm the artist Bob Robert Smith, who's Patrick Brill, and mm. he made a wonderful sculpture of his mother, Deirdre Bollars, at the Royal Academy, mm. uh, which, which was not figurative at all and mm. covered in writing. So very populist and acceptable, but to some people uh, that kind of, that, that it, it, it sort of is, you know, a, a figurative sculpture of his mother would be a much more fitting tribute. So I just wondered about this question of taste, especially in the context of public art, where it's not a question of I wouldn't hang it on my wall, but you're using the city as the context. Mm. It's a very tricky one, isn't it? Um, how, how can a work communicate to a broad public and yet not be too literal? You know, I think that the public could often underestimated in their capacity to bring a sophisticated approach to interpretation. Um, years ago, I organised the sculpture at the National Garden Festival in Stoke-on-Trent, and we carried out a survey of people's attitudes to figurative and abstract art, which were pretty evenly weighted. We had assumed that the public would enjoy and respond to figurative work much more readily than abstract. It, it, it was evenly weighted and um, interestingly, people very often said they, they liked something, they didn't know exactly what it meant at first, but they could bring their own interpretation to it. And, you know, reception theory privileges the viewer and, you know, that they people will always um, interpret it within the realms of their own experience or imagination. It's a real challenge for an artist um, to produce something that is of permanent status 
that can endure successive interpretations and have the capacity to bring new meanings to people over a long period of time. It's a real challenge. Kitsch, um, the artist Jan Kitsch once said there are two kinds of bad art, the slick and the inept. And I think the kitsch falls probably into the slick category. <laughs> um, and so it's a tricky one because it does border on the realms of taste, whose taste. And, you know, I find Maggie Hamling's memorial to Oscar Wilde hugely tasteless and kitsch as well. That's, <laughs> that's, my, that's my feeling. <laughs> Thank you. I think, I think uh, there, there are a sequence here. Christian uh, Frost, if, if we could, and then David Leatherbarrow can see, and I think Dagmar had her, her hand up. So let's uh, let's get as many in as we can while we have the privilege of Vivian's. Yeah, hi, uh, hi, hi uh, Vivian, really interesting. And I was sort of interested in your very fantastic first quote from Robert Musil, mm -hmm. who talks about the, the, the monument disappearing. And I was reminded mm -hmm. of the time uh, when I lived in Berlin, and you know the you had the historic uh, Neue Wache, which had sort of turned into a Pieta uh, through the sort of communist notion of, of the universal mother. And then just down the road, uh, the victory, a Russian victory sculpture right in the middle of Berlin, would be the equivalent of having a victory, sort of a Waterloo victory in the middle of London. Oh, sorry, um, Austerlitz uh, victory right in the middle of London. But what struck me most, and I'm just going to share the screen quickly because um, this was the one that, in, and I'm interested in the idea of an encounter. I don't know if can you can you see this. Um, mm. yes. So this this is just outside Wittenbergplatz, and I remember of all of the monuments, this was the most surprising mm -hmm. because it was just a street sign, mm. um, and you encountered it in an unexpected way, in an unprepared way. And um, so this notion of the encounter of the sculpture, both, you know, one sense as a, a victor or a, a um, or the vanquished, um, mm. but in this case as a as a sort of surprise. And mm. I wondered what your what your thoughts are. Does this for, for me, it is a monument, but I think probably some people might question uh, whether that is or not, this particular mm. sign, which you know, obviously talks about the places of horror that uh, we are allowed, never allowed to forget. Mm. I think it looks really interesting. It's a, I didn't know about this and I love the fact that it, it's using um, almost like a ready-made structure, a known form, a street notice board. Um, to chart places that have this horrific connotation attached to them. And it is going to make one do a double take. You know, it's almost like as though it could be a, a bus shelter or something that then becomes this, this monument and very successful tactic. Yeah. So, yeah, it, yeah. it was encounter, <laughs> encounter for me, I think. Yeah, yes. thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for adding to the feast, uh, Christian. Um, can we take David, please? Thank you, Eric, and thank you, Vivian, for a wonderful talk. Um, if memory serves, uh, Muzil said the best way to consign a figure or an event to oblivion is to make a monument to it. Um, <laughs> I. I I, but I think the the sense of it is that that monuments allow memories to persist. And mm -hmm. what I wanted to ask about is is this sense of persistence or perhaps the preservation of the work that was intended by an artist. Mm -hmm. uh, Aldo Rossi says there are two kinds of permanence, pathological and propelling. Mm -hmm. I think um, Here's, here's the question in, in short. Might, might monuments be preserved if we don't um, uh, resist changes to the forms their designers intended? In other words, might, 
memory result from the alterations that I, I don't exactly mean toppling, but I wonder if there's a productive defacement that, mm -hmm. that could elaborate. You had a very beautiful phrase, I thought, domesticating the unreachable. And I guess I'm wondering about the urbanization of memory being tied to a willingness to supplement the intuition of an artist from the past with a contribution from the present that doesn't exactly deface, but suggests mm -hmm. that appropriation mm. uh, requires some measure of, of alteration. Mm. I think it does require some some means of alteration in terms of appropriation. Thinking about the Tatsu Nishi project in um, Liverpool, whereby you could sleep alongside Queen Victoria. And indeed, he has adopted similar tactic in a number of cities internationally. It, it is, one could say it's it's almost temporarily defacing the memorial, but it's bringing it into stark relief, um, something you couldn't possibly do without the intervention of that artist. So you, you really do see it fresh. And I think it's actually a tactic, if you think about it, used by Christo and Jean-Claude, um, by the cladding of say the Pont Neuf or the Reichstag or the Arc de Triomphe, which is going to happen this autumn as their final work, um, you are bringing attention to a known memorial. Um, but then after the two weeks in which it's enjoyed this glorious transformation, you would never see that structure again without the memory of how it had been wrapped. So I think it is, it's introducing a different layer of consciousness onto something which is familiar and as Musil said, it becomes invisible because it's almost over familiar. You're, you're recontextualizing it and, and bringing it back to the fore. But that's, that really applies, I think, to temporary interventions and appropriations. Um, rather than anything else. It was recently put to me, um, I was talking to a friend who is a judge, and I was talking about what I was going to talk about really, and all these um, statues of dominant males um, operating in oppressive political regimes, and she brought up the instance of Bomber Harris, the sculpture in London, which is regularly daubed with red paint. And she said, perhaps instead of taking these statues down, they should be allowed to remain, but there should be a counterpoint commissioned. So Bomber Harris, who was famously bombed Dresden to bits amongst other places, should be countered by a, a young German girl, you know, one of one who suffered, one who was killed. Is, is really a sort of counterpoint to those acts of atrocity. So it's a yeah. very long subject, isn't it? <laughs> no, it thank you. It's, uh, thank you very much. And I think that that, that section on appropriation um, could lead to a an entire seminar on its own. Like, uh, it's incredibly interesting. Um, I won't go further. I ask uh, Dagmar, please, to, to come in and thank you. Hello, Vivian. Very interesting talk. Um, you showed some very powerful examples of um, of public art, which was um, political, highly political. And I think I would be inclined to agree that that public art should have that that dimension of being slightly disturbing and controversial. Um, but when it comes to um, decorations or when it comes to uh, sculpture on buildings and in in fact large areas of the public realm which are actually on on private land you see a lot of monuments which are very innocuous deliberately um, mm -hmm. deliberately 
concerned with not offending anybody. And that's probably more the case now than ever before with this, this atmosphere, of, mm. you know, anxiety about not offending anyone's sensibilities. Mm. I just wonder how you see that developing. I'm thinking, for example, if one goes to um, the city of London, a lot of the sculpture there is, is quite striking, but it's generally not terribly political for obvious reasons, because, um, you know, the land is owned by financial companies who don't want to offend people mm. and so forth. Um, is this a, a problem that you recognize and what do you think would be the solution for architectural monuments and sculpture? Yes, yeah, so I think I, I, I realized that I've chosen to work in a field of visual arts, public art, which is complete minefield. <laughs> and, well aware of that and also the the amount of dross I'm afraid bland dross that is around and there are sculptures and statues that you know really don't convey any meaning um, to anybody other than perhaps the people who commissioned them in the first place and it, it's a matter of good curatorship you know I think it's possibly fear of offending people but that needn't be the case you know i think a, a work of art has a duty to itself a responsibility to itself to be an excellent work of art um, and to communicate its meaning but if it does neither of those you know if it's bland and doesn't communicate then there's a problem um, i'm afraid there's there's a lot of it about <laughs> Yeah. And yet maybe being a, a decorative piece isn't such a bad thing that... No, there's nothing the wrong with... The picture was very... Great decoration. Yeah, Sometimes it's there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> I think it's a question of uh, the terms under which the ambitions and aims under which the work is commissioned, and if it fulfills those ambitions admirably, then, then it's done its job. But it's got to carry on conveying its meaning to successive generations of its permanent. Thank you. I don't know whether there are other hands up. So um, I, uh, it may be my, uh, Jose, can you see others who would? Yes, uh, Jacek, um, Jacek Skarso just raised his hand. Hello, um, thank you very much for this incredible session. I'm afraid my computer decided to, my internet completely switched off at some point, so I missed so much of it, but I but I can't wait to watch it um, uh, in the recording. Uh, Vivian, uh, so uh, for instance, in our, uh, we have a new uh, master's here um, at London Met, which explores the ideal public art and performance. And uh, one of the, uh, so obviously this is incredibly um, relevant, uh, what you're talking about, because uh, um, one of the things that we try to to do particularly uh, to start the MA is to unpick the idea of, of, of the monument, looking also at counter monuments, performative monuments, um, anti monuments, etc. Mm -hmm. And um, and it seems to me as um, as we uh, the more I kind of exp explore the subject with or including with the students and and particularly when they have to then share these ideas with the public. Um, is that, uh, of course, people have, as as we mentioned in, before, that there's people people may have very specific ideas of what what a monument should look like. Should it be permanent? Um, but and it seems to me that now there's um, particularly through the ephemeral practices, temporary and ephemeral, um, and particularly in performative monuments, which may not look for monuments at all, that the idea of monuments becomes has become more and more. Um, to me, it makes more more and more sense as as a framing concept than necessarily as a definition. Um, so that it be, almost becomes a provocation to call that, for instance, to create a performance and call it um, uh, and and sort of see it within the frame of monumentality. Um, mm -hmm. do, do, I don't know whether they, there's um, there's um, uh, a movement that's happening in that direction. Uh, but equally, I'm mindful of, of what uh, Dagmar, you were saying before, that there's also th that same process is also uh, going hand in hand with an increasing anxiety on what we call a monument. So th mm -hmm. there's an interesting sort of ambivalent movement that's happening, uh, mm -hmm. which is quite fascinating. I was wondering yes. what you thought that. Well, the, the term is very fluid, isn't it? It's very malleable. And monuments implies something grand and usually something permanent, but mm. 
of course, the anti-monumental lobby is challenging that and reinterpreting it as something that is can be ephemeral, um, maybe as a monument in the mind. Mm. Certainly isn't in stone or fixity. Um, so something can be huge in its impact, um, but not necessarily in a built form. Mm -hmm. And monuments and memorials are often talked of as I did in the same breath, but of course a memorial can be something that's more specific, commemorating personal event, etc, etc. And, and it might be tiny, as we saw with that magical little example from mm -hmm. Budapest, which is sort of anti-monumental in its scale, but is um, a, almost like a, a hand size memorial and yet huge in mind. So it'd be Definitely. really interesting to see what Budapest does in terms of this mm -hmm. ephemeral memorial to women who were raped during wartime. Yeah. And I can't wait to see how they would approach it. It was Definitely. quite terrifying. Mm. <laughs> what an interesting <laughs> subject for your students. Well, it's, <laughs> and, student. it's, and, and it's interesting because it's just <laughs> literally developing, you know, uh, the more we look into it, the more the more we're developing what what this uh, this course means because the subject itself continues to be redefined. So thank you so much for this. Really, really interesting. Oh, it's a pleasure. I think Matthew is uh, is has raised his hand. So please. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to come come back, um, picking up on what Jacek was saying, and also um, with with regard to this question of what the public this idea of what the public's appetite is. And um, I mean, you said something earlier, uh, um, Vivian, about the kind of um, the kind of anti-woke sentiment of the government, um, but but perhaps the public appetite for, for what monuments are or the public's, uh, if I can use that phrase, the public's sort of sense of how monuments should be more appropriate it is very much changing and it does seem to me that some of those um, projects and I'm thinking of for instance some of some of the projects that came out of the 14 to 18 now set of commissions mm -hmm. um, like the Tom Piper project with all of those poppies these temporary um, uh, projects really do capture the public imagination mm -hmm. more successfully uh, and end up um, uh, being a huge uh, ha having that m function of the monument much more effectively than the monument that quietly goes up and is there forever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. I think. How how can I respond? Really, I think that um, you know, the huge power to those pieces. It was a, a massive installation, wasn't it? And very very moving quite extraordinary, a huge popular appeal. And then I by the curatorial, it changed context and meant something again to different. And partly it realities. seems to me because it had the element of participation in it, which people could respond to, they could see mm -hmm. themselves as being part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It was very, very successful. And I think the Jeremy Della, the we're here because we're here, was also very successful and, and worked by this surprise element, you know, only being only taking place over a day. You know, it really did capture people's imaginations and <laughs> the ability for you to engage or not engage was there. So Thank you. Question. Yeah, I, I must say, obviously, what we uh, are touching on is other uh, themes through permanence and uh, installation. Um, and one realizes that actually uh, in the in the uh, in, in the narrative and the uh, perspective you've given us tonight, there's still the entire uh, world of marking a place and uh, public art. In, in a celebratory dimension that uh, has not been part of tonight. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can uh, we can persuade you to come back, Vivian. Um, I think in conclusion, I think Nicholas, you have one more point, and I think then our time is uh, is more or less due. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm just uh, interested in and in further in, uh, investigating um, D D David Leatherborough's point, which is a, which is a really interesting one about this idea of productive defacement or the idea that that the monument is a structure that or is a setting which which uh, encourages some form of um, interaction, maybe um, alteration over time. And one of the things, of course, it, it is fundamental to our, at least our common perception of the monument is it's it's certain kind of entitlement to a place, it's fixity with respect to a place. So even the establishment of a monument assumes that that the the setting within which it's located is by all accounts permanent, uh, mm -hmm. and it's not to be moved. It's not to be the, so this kind of reverence to the monument is not just the object itself, but where it's located. And of course, what we've seen in recent days is the very opposite, that monuments are actually things that can be lit literally uprooted and moved. Mm. And in the process of the defacement, uh, one, some people would say they're abuse, but then others would say it's a kind of constructive interaction with the monument, mm. is that they are then relocated somewhere else. And there's a whole discussion about the, you know, the, the, the future of statues uh, of um, people who were slave owners, as we know from Bristol and elsewhere, do we lo relocate them in museums? So they do have an afterlife, but they're they're actually, uh, they're kind of sanctioned as objects of, of memory, but, but in ways that actually have a much more uh, kind of creative, more interactive uh, relationship with history, a history that we, that's come to pass, that we actually begin to realise, which we probably didn't or we chose to ignore in the past. So I think that question of place to me is really fundamental to this idea of mm. of uh, productive in, you know, interaction with, with the monument. Yes, absolutely. And just taking the Bristol case as an example of Colston's statue off its plinth, you know, so it's immediately disempowered. And then if you place it within the context of the museum um, with an interpretation programme attached to it, it, it disempowers it again. It's uprooted from its place, and it's recontextualized, it's made very benign, quite powerless really. Mm. It's a fascinating subject, you know, what should one do with these, you know, maybe Budapest again has the answer to um, <laughs> corral its <laughs> statues in Memento Park. Um, which becomes something of a apparently a tourist attraction and one can poke fingers at Lenin and Stalin and so forth and and, and jeer at them um, without them necessarily being destroyed. Like one of the most powerful interactive responses by the public I think was the first example I showed which was the Jochen Gertz in Harburg, Hamburg um, where the public invited to inscribe their initials into the lead surface, um, which now is invisible. And it inevitably it attracted some neo-fascist graffiti as well as many, many signatures. But that was a risk that the artists and the, the work took, that it was strong enough to incorporate those marks of defacement as well as signature. They became part of the work. Oh, fascinating area. <laughs> I don't know what we do with toppled statues. <laughs> Thank, thanks Vivian. I think it's extremely interesting to, uh, to you know, if one thinks about uh, obviously Black Lives Matter as one huge racial issue, the, there is actually in Germany something that's very evident, which is a generational tension. Mm -hmm. And um, that has manifested itself in many ways, not least some of the examples you showed. So I think another subject would be the uh, the different, uh, uh, you know, uh, reactions uh, within the cultural framework, um, which you touched on very, very interestingly, which could also be, you know, a subject that could be taken further. But I think um, in the interest of of, of the programme and time, um, I think at that point I'd like to draw a conclusion and thank 
you hugely uh, for opening the doors of, uh, of perception on the subject so elegantly and uh, giving us a huge amount of food for thought and to everyone who's participated. And I think just to reiterate that the next of these will be, I think Matthew said, on the 27th of April with Patrick Lynch. So uh, looking forward to that hugely. And in the meantime, uh, well wishes uh, and uh, we'll meet again soon. Yeah, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for the Thank you very much.